doing the following the normal regime on the standard of revenues less expenses and then 25 percent why don't why don't i have the option so what this says is that if you don't apply this so indirectly they are giving you an option to elect because it says if you don't apply this then we can respect it but you have to be in that situation for five years so you can't pick and choose this year i'm better off this way so you are planning this year i'm better off this way so i'm going this way next year no my situation has changed so now i want three percent what it is saying is that if you disapply this rule then for the next five years you go with what we won't apply the modified taxation regime for you so that's the the risk you take but otherwise it's there for you to apply there was the other question on withholding tax credits that's locked in, that you are not getting back. How do you get that? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think, as we have it now, if the credits are for previous years, you do not have the opportunity to use it to, to arbitrarily use it yourself for current year, um, against current year taxes. What you can do is one, try and quicken the audit because the tax authority have to be satisfied that they truly owe you, even though you went to pay the taxes or somebody was held on your behalf. They have to be comfortable that they truly owe you. Mm. So one, I'll say practically, quicken your audit process. Some of us are afraid of audits, but if we have everything clear, call them in because sometimes they can be hanging for so long. Call them in, let them come and certify the credits you have. Then on that basis, it's money they owe you, and you can comfortably agree to use it against a subsequent payment. Two, you can also try, it's something we don't do a lot, but we have opportunity to apply for withholding tax exemption, where if you have a reason, if you can justify that, let, let's say one year loss-making entity, you've been making losses for so long, and you can justify that, or your profit margin is not as high as that percentage they are withholding on you, then you can use that as basis. Now we have a very long checklist. And trust me, before you finish that, they have to make sure you are fully compliant with taxes. Something as simple as filing your director's returns can be a reason, or even registering on the e-portal can be a reason for you to be denied. So if they see you are fully compliant, then they can give you an exemption so that people do not withhold on you for you to build credits that you can't get until, until the future. And maybe coming to Uncle John, what I would say on that, sometimes, especially when you're operating under sole proprietorship or you are a single, uh, I mean, a one-man person operating, you have so many businesses. Mm. Some are making losses, some are making profits. And unfortunately, our tax laws do not, make, do not give you the chance to file consolidated returns like we have in other countries. So if you have different entities, one making a loss, one making a profit, for those making losses, yes, you can carry it forward for some years, but for those making the profits, you have to be paying the taxes. So sometimes it's just about how you manage your, your business structure such that you can collapse some of these divisions and entities together so that some of the loss making, you can make use of the losses against the profit that other divisions are making. So you can, you can take advantage and not be paying taxes that you can't use the, the value in a long while. Well. So there's a question that's just come through well, um, from social media. Now, delivery service providers uh, like Courier, uh, are supposed to charge VAT on their service. Um, and the question is, what is the difference between what we do and normal taxis and Uber if we're just transporting people and <laughs> packages around? Why should they be paying VAT, uh, but you don't pay VAT on your taxi fare? Um, so, again, it comes back to um, the comments on how, unfortunately, um, our laws uh, are drafted. So, remember, we started off with the fact that the general position is VAT is due on everything, 
except where it is actually stated that VAT is not due on it. So if you look at the way our law is structured, it exempts um, public transport, and so that is why they would not be charging VAT. So which is why you see that if I sit in my Medina Trotro, I will not be paying VAT. But if I went to um, one of these car hire um, entities to actually rent a car, they will charge me VAT. So it comes down um, to, to how our laws are drafted. Mm. And should we be taking a second look at our laws, which George has mentioned, I think that's a national conversation we, we need to have. Mm. And oh, just one more thing yeah. on, on the refunds. I know that for a number of the SMEs, what we typically do is to walk into the tax offices and talk to a compliance officer about um, how my TCC is assisting with you, how is the X amount. I think we should start, I don't know, probably some people are, but I think we should actually start putting it in writing, officially request for the refund. They may not come to do the order straight away, but there's something on your files to show that you have requested for a refund of your credit before time runs out on, on that. So that's just a, a, a point I wanted to make on the refunds. Okay. When you're invoicing, you break the, so there's the remuneration and then reimbursables. Um, but the entity you are invoicing, your client says, only charge VAT on your remuneration and not on the reimbursable. But the tax man expects you to have charged it. Okay, I'm not the tax expert on this one. Uh, uh, please, that is the question. <laughs> <laughs> sure, that was a good one. So um, it brings us back again to the issue of reimbursables. It's, it's a real issue because our law, Gifty mentioned earlier, does not specifically deal with the, with the issue of um, reimbursables. And so I, I think what the tax authority is trying to do is to probably plug the loophole where people can say that I'm supposed to make like a thousand, but what I'm going to do is allocate 200 to reimbursables so that um, my, my income on which VAT should be charged is just 800. So if you look at how they, they are doing their things and in the absence of specific laws that deal with reimbursables, that seems to be the way they are going. Now, how do you go about this? Um, we alluded to the fact earlier that if something, if a cost is really a reimbursable cost, then it is not your proper cost. It wouldn't sit in your books as a cost. And any underlying invoices would be in the name of the third party that you're recharging. If you have these things in place, when the tax authority comes, then it's easier to show them that this is really not my cost, it is not my revenue either. There's invoice X from so and so entity that I have passed on to that person. Um, in certain situations, they seem to accept that argument. But if you, if you have a flat amount of, say, reimbursable that you can't support as a reimbursable, then they also have a challenge um, accepting that it is not your income that you have just planned to split so that you don't account for VAT properly. So it comes down to how we are um, accounting for our things again and the substance of what it is we are doing. Are you just splitting revenue and calling it reimbursable? Remember that what you decide to call something in your books is not necessarily the meaning the tax man would give to it. So if it is a reimbursable, that presupposes it is neither your income, it is neither your Cost. And so you have documents to show that it is a third party cost that I am just passing on. If you have that, then most of the time they would accept. Um